think that far back, but I think uh, I used to meet Brian and uh, Nicky and, uh, and they said they got this film coming up and all of a sudden I found myself on it. There was a workshop and there I was and several other people appeared and uh, there was no drawings as such or anything. We just sort of sat there looking at each other and all of a sudden a sketch appeared and uh, we started hacking away at all this wood. And we had, there, was a, there was a carpenter there Brian called Brian Eakes um, and, uh, and he, he took one look at this and he thought it was a load of old rubbish and of course me being a pattern maker, or I had been trained as a pattern maker, I got, took great chunks of wood and started hacking them about and making all the engine cowlings and things. And then and Brian was sort of getting chunks of plywood and formers and, and doing the actual uh, part of the body. So the whole thing was coming together. And then we had another bunch who appeared with Bill Pearson and Martin Bauer and they, and they were the dreaded rig getters. And they seem to have great bucketfuls of broken up plastic kits which they seem to dip into glue and uh, spread about all over the place and gradually built up this wonderful great big pyramid of bits and pieces. And uh, it was like throwing oil and water together and then it all, it all came up to the surface and people found their own sort of niches. And um, that was the way it was, you know, and uh, we got started. I suppose I was one of the oldest ones there so I sort of automatically sort of took over I suppose really mm. and run it. So there was two like camps first and both camps were taking the mickey out of each other you know you don't, that's not the way it doesn't look like a model from the <laughs> wickets and and we didn't think what they were doing looked look like models either but uh, eventually it all got them together and uh, and even Brian took an interest in it after we sort of got a shape there and in come uh, all the art department, they wanted it from every colour under the rainbow. I'm sure you remember that. It's, it went from grey, yellow, blues, and, and then it had a sort of a military look, and then I was scared stiff that the wiggitters were going to come along and, and, and make it look like a Christmas tree, but that seemed to disappear. And, uh, and it went back to a sort of a military look. And, and of course, by the time the whole thing got together, it, it changed slowly. and. But it became an enormous great lump, really. It was great fun to work on. <clears throat> I, th I often wonder, because I was talking yesterday about when I was a kid at school, in 1953, I think it was, and we were talking about aliens and, and uh, UFOs. And there was hundreds of us, one lunchtime, sitting on the school playing fields, and someone noticed four objects up in the sky. And they were four bright objects and they seemed to be moving around slowly above the clouds and there was hundreds of people looking at these things and all of a sudden they shot off at enormous speed and that was the last time I was on and it was in the papers and but over the years you think I oh, am I thinking about this am I making it up as I go along and I was saying the other day like I'd seen hordes of bombers going and I was outside with my grandfather and quite counting them back when they come back from the war but you, you sometimes think, do you remember seeing this or has this been implanted in your brain by seeing television and films later? I don't know. Mm. It's one of them things as you get older you, you have to live with. You never know. Any, no. mm. And I, I'm, I'm, I presume now with this you'll find all different versions of it. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, we enjoyed doing that and then Brian came along one day and said that uh, we would be breaking into two and half was staying there and, and the other half were going on to Star Wars. and. That was another adventure, you know. And we were up to Shepparton, and uh, Peter Beale gave us the scripts to read that weekend, and we thought it was a load of crap. <laughs> but I'm sorry, but it wasn't because I read Scott. So there we are. So I was involved with Philip on the sleeping hyper thing, doing the hydraulics on that, and then we went on the gun with Nick because this is a way they're going to kill the alien. And so they made the mock-up and we tested it on the lawn, which gave a very big blank, which was deadly. And then we went on to other things like the the going down into the sleeper, down to the eggs. I was involved in making the eggs move and uh, made various types, and some were quite rude. But uh, no, it was good. And then we started going up in the irons with Sigourney with the alien inside the capsule and then we weren't allowed to uh, see it 
and the, and the crew were getting a bit low. So Peter Bill asked Ridley if we could have a showing. Then he made a sequence up. And we all went, because the crew we went down low. We were working seven days a week, very long hours. And Ridley was hard at times. And uh, all of a sudden it brought the energy back into the film. Mm. And then when Brian went off to do Star Wars, this is where Ron went, and Philip and Dave Watkins. Yeah. Those people. We were staying back at Bray with Ridley doing effects. And he was organising us with Nick doing the landing sequence, <coughs> undercarriage sequence, snow, mm -hmm. a lot of smoke, mm -hmm. typical Ridley. And uh, some of the takes were very stop motion. We used to draw a line on the floor, measure every foot, and took a, a second to take to the depth of off the models. Mm -hmm. Then we did the big land, landing sequence, which we had a forklift truck, and a pole arm going in the side of the model, and we had the bottles on the other side to balance it, and we had uh, nitrogen, CO2, and all that to give the thrust. And uh, that was good. Mm. Yes. Mayhem. <laughs> it was good. Was it me, or was it true that you started working on the Nostromo out of uh, frustration because the drawings didn't arrive on time and you just had to start something? It was a small sketch. We never had working drawings of blueprints. Mm -hmm. We had a small small piece of paper on me. We you started putting things together. We had, we had, I think there was an idea, and it came from Nicky or Brian, how big they wanted this thing, because they were going to put it on a gimbal and whatever. And I, and I think they felt they needed a certain size. So there was the dimensions of, you know, the rough size of it, right. but it was, and that was it, wasn't it? That was it. And but you uh, came to Shepparton with Brian Eek one day to see Ridley about the releasing of the separation of the arm and the top. Yeah, yeah. And he drew a 50 feet piece. Mm. That's how it was. But it, um, no, there was no working drawings and no, no such. I mean, when we went on the Star Wars, that was the most organised film I've ever worked on. I mean, you've got everything. You've got all the drawings for what you're going to make, all the R2-D2s, everything like that was mapped out, all the storyboards. And I find a lot of that now in modern films has disappeared. They, yeah, they, seem to, they don't seem to have any idea of how to put a film together. I hate to say it, but it seems to be nowadays. Mm. It's, it, everything, everything was storyboarded, and everything, 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 a drawing came up exactly what you got to do. Even where the camera was going to go. Yeah. On the drawing was the camera mark, that's got to be, that's it. Mm. But so now it's, um, it seems to be a different way of doing things. Mm. Yeah. There was a lot of back banter going between the lighting cameraman and Nick, wasn't there? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he somehow got his beard and, and wound it into a vice. Oh, he did in Litchfield. <laughs> that's right. I don't know how he did that. Got him to have a look at something and then wound it quickly, wound his beard into the vice and left him there. He stuck. <laughs> Yeah, it came out too. Yeah. Oh, Nicky Nick, was full of tricks, wasn't he? Yeah. Now I've got, um, I've seen a photograph of Sigourney Weaver snogging you, Roger. I was snogging with her, that? yes. How did that happen? She was giving our t-shirts out to us. Uh, Sigourney used to be opposite the workshop and she used to watch us through and then she'd come in and make us tea and that. And then she came in one day with these t-shirts with the blood and everybody got a kiss off her. So everybody went, took a picture of each other, taking the Sigourney, and then I showed Sigourney on the third alien. She said, that was a long time ago, Roger. And that was lovely, great. You obviously Ah, so it's Recently. Lovely. What? Bray Studios was picked as a place where we could not only build the models, but also film them. Mm -hmm. So we acquired once one of Brace, Brace Studios' stages, which we turned into a workshop, which was right opposite a large stage where we filmed it. Yeah, by the Nissan Suts and the outside toilets. For those people who don't remember the outside toilets. Um, so that's the smaller stage was converted into a workshop with benches and with all the tools, etc., etc. Then our second job then was to start actually creating the models. Now we're waiting for the drawings. Well, a sketch came along of Nostromo. Just a sketch. 
hand drawn, photocopied, and that was it. So Ron Holmes said, well, where's my drawings? Where do I start? Well, after the few days of where do I start, in the meantime, obviously, we're doing things like ordering materials and everything, you know, work is still going on. Where are my drawings? No drawings. That was it. One sketch about this size of the Nostromo. I said, that's it. But from that one sketch, he had to build a Nostromo. Nick Alder did iron framework to go inside it because obviously it had to be supported both from both sides, back and front and underneath, you know, for various camera angles, etc. So, Ron Home bless his little cotton socks, carried on and did all the, with, uh, I think Brian Eek did the, the, the timber work and then covered it with uh, a skin ply and everything else. Then the Kiddiewinks, as we called them, because uh, they were all young models. They had modelling experience, but not film experience particularly, but all very keen, you know, film people. Very keen on science fiction and, and models and things like that. So they, that, that was uh, fine. They, they, they went on merrily. So Ridley came down as soon as he finished main unit, unit shooting every night. Filmed with us till about 11. Then he went into the editing suite. How he had the energy to carry on because he was back on the main stage at Shepperton, you know, at sort of seven o'clock in the morning to film main unit stuff. But he left us work to do during the day um, and then came back and carried on sh shooting with us and then gave us work for the next day. But he was very, very much involved in the model shooting, very much involved. It was the, one of the best summers we've had, as it happens. So every morning the sun would be shining, the birds would be singing. We'd go into a stage that was covered with black velvet. And obviously when all the house lights went out, the only thing that was lit was Nostromo and little pen torch lights on the on the uh, dolly, which was Nick Nick had put onto electric motors so Everything went up and down by electrics. So we spent one of the best summers we ever had in pitch bloody dark. And when we came out at 11 o'clock at night after Ridley had finished, of course we came back out in the dark. <laughs> so we never saw that summer. It was Mary Minnison came along and she was doing a shoot dressed as a policewoman. Nothing to do with us, but she obviously she came in where the models were being built and uh, the chaps then got outside with her in this little skimpy police uniform and all had their pictures taken. Very horny. Uh, that was one little gem amongst the, amongst the work. But everybody got on very well together. Uh, now Guy Hudson wasn't actually on the model unit he was with the main unit. I, I, I was absconded sometimes to the main unit where uh, Guy and uh, Dennis were working on panels, etc., for the interiors of the Nostromo. Um, and they, the pair had this fantastic way of working. Like they got all these scrapped aeroplane parts and they virtually got got the wooden panel that the uh, designers had put in the set, took them out as a plain panel, crashed and banged and walloped these things into there, and it looked, ended up looking absolutely fantastic. And considering the mess their workshop was in, with all these bits of aeroplane left, right and centre, you didn't know where you were at a 
stars to tell you the altitude or to say you're already dead. There was black boxes, etc. everywhere. But the end result was all these bits and pieces and Guy and Dennis, they were fantastic. Guy was a cheeky, horrible little sod sometimes, but he was funny, amusing, and he was very artistic and he did a great job. So the panels and everything you see on the interior are down to those two. And after we finished all the model shooting at Bray, we also did inserts. Um, and one of them was when the coloured guy got the alien tongue bursting through his, through his skull. Well, what we did there was we had a, a wax um, mask of, the, of his face and the tongue with the teeth were on a ram, which Nick had, Nick had designed. And on, on the action, he went straight in, smashed the skull and came back out. But behind it we had real uh, sheep, sheep and pigs brains packed in there. But it worked very well every time. Except one tape which was absolutely brilliant, which I don't think they used because it was too good. It went in, as it came out, it really picked up on the brains. So instead of sort of spilling out, it actually dragged all the brains out with it. And of course we did it at high speed, so it really looked gruesome. And I think, actually the reason they didn't put it on in the actual film was probably half the audience probably thrown up. <laughs> but uh, talking about awful, um, Guy Hudson, who was on with the main unit, um, in between making all these panels up, his, he had a, his number one job was washing all the real offal out in a sink. Being the youngest on the main unit crew, was given the job of hanging over the sink with all this offal and intestines and everything else, washing them out. He didn't like it. And he threw him up, but they kept sending him back in there, and dutifully he went back in there. No wonder he was so thin. Even though he had three breakfasts a day, that offal kept him thin. We, Nick had built a Luma crane, a, a version of a Luma crane, for high shots and things. So on t while he was testing it, he actually went up on, he got up to the, over the top of the roof of one of the stages where he found some very strange plants growing. Well, of course, there was only one person to blame. And it began with Guy, who had his own little crop growing upstairs on top of the roof of the studios. Ah! Yes, now Roy Thomas, now Roy Thomas was the security officer at Bray Studios, who I never forgave because he uh, introduced me to my ex-wife. But apart from that, Roy Thomas, the security man at Bray Studios, um, had a bag of dope. And because he didn't want to patrol around the studios, in official business with it in his pocket, he put it on the top shelf in the canteen. Well, the dear Irish lady, who was a cook, mistakenly took it for the stuffing. So she stuffed his whole stash, I mean, it was a big bag, into the turkeys for the Christmas lunch. After the Christmas lunch, <laughs> With his stuffing and the turkey and the roast potatoes, etc., they were very, very happy people. Roy Thomas came back later in the afternoon to reclaim his stash, only to find it's gone. Asked where it was. Oh, Jesus, he said, I thought that was the stuffing you brought me. So I put it in the turkey. That was a happy day.
for all concerned, except Roy Thomas. In the beginning, I went and I see Ron and someone else working on the last drawing. And it didn't look quite right somehow. And I said, where's the drawings? And I said, we didn't get any drawings. And I said, fancy making something.